Hello and welcome to Beyond the README. Today we're going to be taking a look at understanding sidecar containers. Not just how to configure them, but actually what they do under the hood and how they work. So a little bit of background. You're probably familiar with the sidecar pattern. You probably already know that it involves running multiple containers side by side within a pod. This typically consists of the main application container as well as some supporting containers that are referred to as sidecars. These sidecar containers typically provide some kind of helper functionality to that main application container, and this can range from everything from proxying network calls, automatic TLS, populating shared volumes, everything like that. But of course, how does a sidecar actually work under the hood? Maybe you've configured an additional container inside of a pod definition, but do you really understand what's going on at the operating system level to enable this sidecar pattern? That's what we're going to be looking at today. So first, an overview on the environment setup in case you want to follow along. I'll be using K3S on Ubuntu 22.04. K3S is very easy to install, just look it up online, and you can run it in basically a single shell script to install the K3S single binary Kubernetes distribution. If you want to follow along with this video, you really need access to the underlying Kubernetes node, so running in a hosted Kubernetes service might not be the best option. And in this case, I've set up a pretty simple topology. I've deployed HashiCorp Vault using the official Helm chart, and I'll include links to my Helm values and things like that. So I have Vault running in my cluster just in development mode, and I've also configured the Vault Agent Sidecar Injector. I have a very simple workload, just a curl container running, and the agent is injected as a sidecar into that pod. In this case, the Vault Sidecar Container is also configured to proxy network requests to Vault. So we're going to be taking a look at how that interaction works and what that looks like on the underlying Kubernetes node to understand how this sidecar pattern is actually enabled. So starting out here on the left, I've just got a Visual Studio Code editor, and on the right, I've got some terminals open to my K3S cluster. And you can see here I have a pretty simple pod definition that defines a single curl container inside of the pod, and it just sleeps forever. So just for demonstration purposes, I'm having the container do nothing. I'm using some annotations to inject the Vault Agent. You'll also notice that my agent config references a config map called Vault Agent, and that's included here as well. And I won't go through this entire config map, I'll include a link to it in the show notes. But basically this agent is going to do two things. It's going to template out my secret, which is the default behavior of the Vault Agent. So it's going to write that to a shared volume on the file system that both containers can access. And then I also have it configured to listen on localhost 8200 and proxy API calls to Vault. So what you'll see is this enables my curl container to make requests to localhost as if it were talking directly to Vault without worrying about any authentication or anything else. And this is just standard Vault agent behavior. But we're going to look at these two use cases, both volume sharing and network sharing, as they relate to the sidecar pattern. So let's start by creating this pod. And I'll just point out that I've aliased K to kubectl. So anytime you see me use K, you can assume I'm using kubectl. It just saves some keystrokes. Now I can see my pod is up and running, so I'm going to exec into that curl container to take a look at the secrets that Vault has rendered out for me. And now that I'm inside of this container, I can see that there's a Vault Secrets API key value here, and I can see that the data is stored in a map. So the value, this is a secret API key, came from Vault. This is a secret stored inside of a key value secrets engine inside of Vault. Now my curl container isn't responsible for putting this there. This was put there by the Vault sidecar. So somehow both my curl container and my vault sidecar container have access to this location on the file system. You'll also recall that I mentioned having the agent running as a proxy. So I'm inside of my curl container now, and if I issue a curl command and point it at localhost port 8200 and the path of my secret, you can see that this request actually succeeds. I didn't have to authenticate with vault. I didn't have to do anything. I just queried localhost as if I was talking directly to vault and already authenticated. And this is again because my Vault sidecar is authenticating this request and proxying it for me. So this is pretty simple, but how does this actually work under the hood? To understand that, we need to poke around the operating system a little bit on the underlying K3S Kubernetes node. So first, on my Kubernetes node, let's start by finding the process IDs for these running container processes. I know my curl container is just running sleep infinity, so that's pretty easy to find. And then I should be able to find my vault agent using the same procedure. So I can see here I have 12309 as the process ID of that sleep command and 12339 as the process ID of the vault agent command. Now let's take a look at the namespaces that those are running with.
the lsns command will show us the namespaces that a process is running with. And in this case, let's look at the mount namespace since we're dealing with volume mounting. We can see these are actually running in different mount namespaces. These numbers are different. So even though we have this sidecar container, they're not sharing a mount namespace. So that must mean the volume is being shared between them some other way. So we can use the find mount command to find the mounts associated with a particular process. And so now I've used find mount to find the mounts associated with slash vault slash secrets for each of my two processes. And I can see that each of those are mounting a tempfs share. There's also a vault configs directory, so let's take a look at that. We can see inside of the curl container that mount is not found. But if I check my vault sidecar container, that volume is found and it's mounted to a location on my local file system. So in this case, my two containers, my application container and my vault sidecar, are not sharing mount namespaces. They're totally disconnected mount namespaces. I'm just mounting certain file systems inside both of those namespaces. And this is what enables those containers to share that slash vault slash secrets file system. Next, let's take a look at understanding the networking between these two containers. You'll often hear the containers inside of a pod share certain namespaces like the network namespace. So let's look at those namespaces again. So if we look at the namespaces for these two containers, we can see they actually have the exact same network namespace. So they're sharing a network namespace. So in that case, the processes running inside of these containers effectively have the same network. And we can easily verify this using the nsenter command to run a command inside of a namespace. So in this case, I'm going to run a command inside of the network namespace of process ID 12309, and that's my curl container. And I'm just going to use the IP brief link show command to show the interfaces inside of this container. And you can see those interfaces right there. If I do the same thing with the other container, you can see the interfaces are identical. Notice that the MAC address for this interface is exactly the same. So it makes sense that these containers are able to communicate over localhost. They're in the same network namespace, and that's exactly like two processes on a regular machine communicating with each other over localhost. And since these network namespaces are isolated from other pods, we can spin up multiple copies of this same pod definition without conflicting on ports or anything like that. These are separate network namespaces, but the containers within the pod share that namespace, and so they're able to communicate with each other, just like regular workloads running on a Linux host. So in this video, you took a brief look at understanding how sidecar containers actually function. We looked at two different types of sidecar functionality. One that used a shared volume mount to share a file system between a sidecar container and the main application container, and another use case using a shared network namespace to allow two containers to communicate as if they were on the same exact network. Understanding how these foundational concepts work will make you better equipped to make decisions when you're troubleshooting or operating your Kubernetes clusters. Thanks for joining me for this brief video on Beyond the Readme. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like, subscribe, and share with your colleagues. I'd really appreciate it, and I'll see you on our next video.